You know, we uh, climate scientists are planetary physicians, and I had a fascinating experience recently. My doctor retired. I had to get a new doctor. I chose one. We met. And he looked at me and said, sit down. I want to tell you how I feel about practicing medicine. Three things, he said. First, I'm competent. I know what I'm doing. And second, I'm honest. If something happens I don't understand, I'll tell you. And third, I'm only here to advise you. You will make all the decisions. I was really impressed. No doctor had ever talked like that to me before. And there's something else. We climate scientists, planetary physicians, are also competent and honest and only here to advise. So the first interesting question is, is the world really warming? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, it is warming. Here, the temperatures on global average are broken down by decade. You can see the warmest years are the decades on the right. In fact, in each of the last two decades, every single year was warmer than the average temperature of the previous decade. So the world is unequivocally warming. This record goes back to the 1800s, and all of the warmest years in that record are recent years. And there's more evidence for global warming, too. Here, the white up arrows mean increasing trends, the black down arrows mean decreasing trends, and you can see that the ocean and the atmosphere are both warming, sea level is rising, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, but ice and snow cover and glaciers and ice sheets are all decreasing. All of these observed trends are unambiguous signs of a warming world. And we've done diagnosis, like good doctors. So we know it's not naturally caused. So for example, we monitor the sun. The output of the sun is that red line, and you can see it goes up and down, it fluctuates with the 11-year cycle. But there's no long-term upward trend as there is on the blue line, which is temperature. So changes in the sun are not responsible for the warming. And in the same way, we've quantitatively ruled out all the other candidates for warming. It's not natural, it's human-caused. And the main human cause is the waste products from the fuels that we use for most of our energy, coal, oil, and natural gas. When we burn them, we use the atmosphere as a free dump, and the worst waste product for climate is carbon dioxide. It builds up in the atmosphere, and here's the record called the Keeling Curve of more than half a century of measurements showing the increase of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We had long ago predicted that if this strong an increase were to happen, the world would warm because this is a heat-trapping gas that adds to the natural greenhouse effect, and that predicted global warming has now been observed. Sometimes, different aspects of climate change even faster than we had predicted. And here's an example of something we don't fully understand yet. What you're looking at is the extent of Arctic sea ice, which reaches a minimum every year at the end of summer around September. And in recent years, it's often been so low that it's lower than half of what it was before the year 2000. So here's a recent year on the right, a, re a year, typical year before 2000 on the left, and you see this extraordinary change that wasn't forecast. This storm reminds us that climate has many aspects. Global warming is just a symptom, like a fever is a symptom of disease. But two of the things that happen, as I've said, are that the ocean sea level rises and that in the atmosphere, the amount of water vapor increases. And those two changes alone can make severe weather events like hurricanes potentially more damaging because the biggest cause of damage from hurricanes is flooding. Higher sea level increases the risk of ocean flooding and more water vapor in the atmosphere increases the risk of flooding from, from heavy rain. What you're looking at here are computer projections for the four seasons of precipitation changes towards the end of the current century. Green is wetter, brown is drier. And in general, the wetter regions become even more wet and the drier regions become even more dry. So you can see the northern United States is becoming more wet in winter, the southwestern United States is becoming more dry in spring. The west is already arid and further drying can have severe consequences. So it can reduce agricultural productivity, for example, and it can increase the risk of wildfires. In Southern California, most of the water we use is already imported from Sierra Snowpack and from the Colorado River, and both of those water sources are shrinking because of global warming. 
the diagnosis from we climate scientists, your planetary physicians, is that the world is seriously addicted to fossil fuels. And the right thing to do is to end this addiction as soon as possible. Otherwise, global warming will continue unabated. The way to, to limit it to moderate or tolerable levels is to reduce the world's dependence on fossil fuels with the consequent increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that leads to global warming. There's no silver bullet that solves this problem, but there's lots of silver buckshot. Increased ener energy efficiency, increased energy conservation, help, and greater reliance on sun and wind and water is essential. These renewable resources are already widely available and often cost competitive with fossil fuels. You can ask what's the best way to encourage a transition to clean energy. And uh, the answer is that many thoughtful people have advocated carbon taxes of various kinds. But climate scientists are not generally experts on taxes. We're all specialists, you know. You don't ask your cardiologist for advice on a root canal, and you don't speak to your dentist about heart surgery. So what people should do is listen to experts on energy policy and on taxes, and then decide. Here's the bottom line, if you like, a forecast of what the warming is likely to be in the United States toward the end of the current century for two different scenarios. On the right is what we can look forward to if growth of heat-trapping gases continues unabated, if we continue to emit these gases into the atmosphere. And what you see is a warming that for many parts of the United States amounts to seven or eight degrees Fahrenheit. That's very, very large and will have severe consequences. On the left is an alternative future. If we restrict the emissions of heat-trapping gases like carbon dioxide, we can limit warming by the end of this century to perhaps half of what it is on the right, say three or four degrees Fahrenheit. That's much to be, pre prepared, <coughs> much to be preferred. And we have that choice now. The future is in our hands. We control the thermostat on the climate that our children and grandchildren and their descendants will inherit. Because carbon dioxide, once it's in the atmosphere, accumulates. It stays there for a very long time. And so while we're dithering and procrastinating and wondering what to do, it's building up in the atmosphere. Thus, the window of opportunity to exercise the choice that we have doesn't stay open forever. In fact, it closes very soon. So it's urgent that we make a decision, we, the people of the world, make a decision to limit the growth of heat-trapping gases. I think that what you do about global warming shouldn't depend on your politics. I think that all of us should want to preserve and protect the planet that we have to avoid contamination and pollution, to cleanse and purify rather than to misuse and degrade. That should be a choice for everyone. So I'm a climate scientist and a planetary physician, and uh, we're competent, we know what we're doing, we're honest, when something arises that we don't know about, we'll tell you. And we're here to advise, not to make decisions. So listen to your doctors. You'll learn something useful. But then you, all of you, will decide. Thank you.